This is Dan McCarthy, and you're listening to the Check In Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Check In. Today, my guest is Ellen Betridge, the current president and CEO of Uniworld Boutique River Cruise Collection, and one of the most well-traveled in terms of careers and companies, people that I've been fortunate enough to speak to on this podcast. Every time the topics of industry careers and travels come up, People would tell me that you may leave your current company, but typically what happens in this industry is most people never leave once travel gets their hooks into them. And Ellen and her career is one of the great examples of this. She mentions how she started her travel career with a retail agency as a quote unquote Friday girl more than 30 years ago. But from there, she's moved on to work at companies like American Express, where she spent more than two decades. Silver Sea, Ozamar, Sandals, and now Uniworld. It's incredibly admirable to hear her speak about her career and her confidence in herself and the travel businesses she's been a part of. It's something I know a lot of people can learn from. I always thought it was some kind of giant secret to be able to succeed so well across so many incredible companies, but she makes it seem simple, though I'm still sure it may be a little more complicated than that. Perform, be kind, keep your connections, and don't be afraid to learn. This is episode 12 of this series, and this conversation is one of the first times I've heard someone who has spent so many years in travel and is so and has been so incredibly successful talk about valuing learning and experience over things like titles and compensation. It's a lesson that caught me off guard when she was speaking about it, and it's one of those things that I'm hoping to communicate through these interviews. Making a move to an unfamiliar part of a business with a lesser title and learning and being able to improve your actual learning skills is something that Ellen says has helped her blossom in every role she's taken on in the industry. I want to thank her for speaking with me before I pass it over to the conversation. I know her travel has picked up significantly. She speaks about it at the beginning of the episode and time is increasingly becoming more valuable than ever for everyone. I know you all are traveling more too and are busier than ever. And I want to thank you all in advance for listening too. I truly appreciate it. So let's check in with Ellen. Hi there, how are you? Hi, Ellen, how are you? What's the, your virtual backgrounds, that's obviously a Uniworld ship. What ship? It is. That is the super ship Beatrice. Beatrice, okay. Yes. And when did that, when did that debut? That was, that's a fairly recent ship, isn't it? It is. So she was 2019, 2019. Okay. Yeah. So to, she used to be just the Beatrice, and then we uh, kind of transformed her to be the super ship Beatrice. So she's got additional restaurants and more suites, and uh, she's really, she's stunning. I, she's actually one of, I love the, the light colored wood and the blue, and it's really pretty. It is very pretty. It is very nice. Uh, it, and that's that's the lounge at the back of the ship. Is that right? Because it kind is. Of see yeah, it. that's the main lounge. The Mozart, I think it's called the Mozart Lounge. Uh, all the name, all the um, different venues are named after um, um, different types of artists. And so I think that's the Mozart Lounge. And then behind it, actually very cool, on the new super ships as well, we've added in like a little bistro, okay. um, like a little restaurant. So that's actually really nice too. So you have another place where you could grab a bite during the day if you need that extra snack. Okay. And you just got back from, did, you just got back from christening a new, a new, a new river ship, didn't you? Yeah, two in a row, believe it or not. Oh. Um, so on June 27th, I was over in Italy and we launched the super ship La Venezia. So she used to be the um, the River Countess, uh, once again, completely transformed. And when I say we redid her, we didn't just put, to, you know, in new carpets. We take out everything, you know, like all the plumbing, all the wiring, yeah. and basically all that's left is the hole, and then we build it back up. Uh, okay. So we've just really given this ship, it's a very sustainable way to act, and also just given the ship a whole new life. And then from there, I headed over to Portugal, where we launched a brand new ship called the Super Ship Sao Gabriel on the, on the Douro. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. So it's uh, and we got one more coming. I'm going heading over to Egypt on September 25th to launch the new super ship Sphinx. So how does it how does it feel? I mean, I, I saw the photos of of the ceremonies. Yeah. I think the 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 Venetia ceremony I saw. I mean, how does it feel to be able to do that after after the pandemic, after not only being paused for operations but being paused for plans? Like, how does it, how does it feel to be able to? be there when new ships are being announced you can see the crew on board things like that yeah it's, it's actually really emotional um yeah. you know the crew they're our employees and so during this entire time we kept in touch with them and we did a lot of uh, zoom calls and we you know had a lot of co funny contests and things that yeah. crew actually did a contest where they did who could do the most um 
uh, uh, squats. They had a squat contest, believe it or not. Okay. And, and so there's videos of people doing squats uh, in all different places around the world. Um, so that was a lot of fun. So it was kind of weird to walk on board and to see their faces in person and to see how happy they were to be working. And it wasn't just them though, it was the guests. Um, the guests on board were just absolutely thrilled to be there and to be connecting with everybody. So it was nice. Yeah, it must and, be nice. Cause I, I assume you've had such a long career in travel. You have to be used to just constantly being on the road. Uh, yeah. for better or worse. Yeah. I mean, so the pandemic must have been a weird feeling for you. I mean, uh, pandemic aside, but just a pause in your business travel must have been a strange feeling. It was. I think uh, probably the person it was strangest for was my husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he was used to having me home so much. You know, it was, it was, there was a lot of silver linings. And one of them was that, was being home, spending more time with my family. But, you know, I do miss traveling. I, um, I, I look forward to, I'm one of those people that I just like, I can't sleep almost the night before. I'm, I'm so okay. um, excited about going on to that next adventure. Um, and there's nothing like launching a ship. I mean, there's nothing cooler than walking on board the first time and seeing everything for the first time. Um, it's a, it's a pretty awesome feeling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I'm curious because I've heard this, I've heard different opinions from a number of people in the, in the industry. And I always thought it'd be one opinion because of the nature of the travel industry, but has, uh, did the pandemic change your perception of, of your own business travel at all? I mean, obviously launching a ship is necessary for you to be there, but like conferences, meetings with other, 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 other groups, other staffs, things like that. Did that change your perception at all during the pandemic? Have you, have you ever, have you thought that, Hey, maybe I can do this on zoom now. Uh, any, anything like that? You know, I've had that moment where maybe there are a few things that maybe you could, I don't have to take that extra trip maybe out to, uh, you know, um, to, you know, Florida one yeah. more time. I could probably do that one on zoom, but I still think there's nothing more important than that face-to-face -face and connecting um, having a meal with somebody um, and seeing people. Um, I like being back out. I you know, just got back from a big conference and that was fantastic to see a lot of people and to connect. Uh, and I look at my travel schedule right now and it is incredibly hectic um, <laughs> starting at the end of this month, all the way through no until Thanksgiving. Uh, I mean, I'm just ups absolutely nonstop. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It feels like the industry is wanting to make up for lost time. This right. this fall seems to be particularly busy for every single person I've, I've spoken yeah. to. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I know people, I I know people have your attitude too. They're very anxious to get back on the road, but I'm sure yeah. maybe at the end of November, things, things, uh, <laughs> opinions might change, but I guess it's just a wait and see game at this point. Yeah. You know, when you, when you're doing it your whole life, you know, it's just what you're used to. Um, yeah. it's the life that we live. And I think we have, we have two different lives, right? We've got the life at home with our families and all this, and we have the life on the road with our friends and people who we know. And it's some of these people I've known for 25 years, you know, yeah. is, you know, so it's, it's crazy. Um, and you know about their families and their kids and their, you know, it's, it's nice to see them again and connect. Yeah. And, and I mean, I don't, I don't have a, like you have a, you have a family, you have, you have a husband and kids at home. Yeah. I don't have that, but I mean, yeah. I found, cause the past month I've been traveling constantly too. And I found, you know, finally appreciating those people at home a little bit more when I'm on the road and when I'm coming back from a trip, as opposed to being around them all the time and every waking right. moment, it, it's, it's been nice both ways. Like. The pandemic, it was nice to appreciate business travel. And now it's nice to appreciate the relationships and the people you have at home too. You know, I completely agree with you. <laughs> yeah. So I want to thank you for joining me today too. I know, again, I know how busy you are, but I was, I was very excited to speak to you because we've had, we, I've got a chance to bump into you a couple of times over the past month. I would thought it would be great to hear your story about your entry into travel. Um, I know you, you've spent a lot of time in a lot of different suppliers and a lot of different companies. And I think you've had, uh, you, you, you shared some great things with me when we were speaking earlier this month too. Yeah, no, you know, um, I, I think I was just meant to be in the travel business. Um, you know, I moved out to New York when I was, uh, 21 years old and I was, uh, going to school at, uh, finishing up at, um, Hunter college in Manhattan. Okay. And, uh, I had been a nanny for the summer and I got a job at a travel agency called better travelers in the New York. And uh, I worked for these three amazing women who they all, they owned the business together. And I learned a lot from them to seeing how they were interacting and stuff. And they hired me as a girl Friday. That was my first title. A girl, um, a girl Friday. That was the girl title? Friday. That's what they called me a girl Friday. That's okay. what the job, that's what the ad said in the newspaper. They were hiring a girl Friday. And it really, I was like the, the gopher. Yeah. I did whatever they told me to do, but I also, what was great is I was anxious and I was curious. So therefore 
before I got to learn that sent me to Saber schools. So I got to go to Dallas and learn, uh, you know, the, the, the system. And so they, they saw that I actually could actually take on more than what they originally planned for me to do. But sadly, I had to leave because I didn't have any medical insurance. I don't know about you, but uh, when you're young, you need medical insurance, yeah. right? And uh, this is a small business. They didn't have those, uh, um, you know, those facilities back then for me. So I went to go work for American Express where I stayed for 23 years. So uh, I worked my way up the ladder throughout that company. I started as a frontline, uh, what's called a TC3, travel clerk three, which is, I think, the lowest position in the entire company. I think it has to have been. Um, and I would actually handwrite tickets and strip tickets and put them together. And I quickly um, learned enough to be able to take calls because I wasn't good enough at make, taking calls at that point. And then I started taking calls. And, you know, and within about uh, two years, I was actually what's called a pace setter, which is their top of the top of travel agents. So I actually, oh, wow. um, m- uh, you know, outpaced my sales and, and um, I realized then that I wanted to do more. So I went off and I became a team leader and then I was a manager and kind of stayed in travel for several years. And then I moved over to the card side of the business and did a few things there. Kind of, I took a lot of lateral moves. And that's one thing I always tell people in your career, it's not always a, um, a ladder. Sometimes it's a jungle gym and you got to be willing to make lateral moves in order to make yourself, you know, more well-rounded and more uh, prepared for the next step. Yeah. Wait, so, so you, you, you said you moved to New York when you were uh, in your early twenties, where were you, yep. where did you grow up? Oh, I grew up in Spokane, Washington. So oh, I'm from Washington state. Uh, so How far Spokane. is Spokane away? I mean, Spokane's a major, is a fairly major yeah. city. Yeah. Major city, huge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it is a major city. It's the second largest city in the state of Washington, followed by Seattle, of course. So Seattle's over on the coast and Washington, uh, uh, Spokane's closer to Idaho. So okay. as an example, when I was a kid, we used to ride our bikes from Spokane to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, which is like 31 miles. And we were like 11 years old and we'd all get on our bicycles. It was like out of a movie. And we'd go and ride our bikes to our lake cabin uh, when we were kids because we wanted to have our bikes there for the summer. So my dad said, well, if you want your bikes, you gotta ride them there. So we all ride our bikes out there and then, you know. And oh my God. With no cell phone, nowhere 30, to contact 31 us. 31 miles too. I know. Yeah. On our little bike, on our little, yeah. you know, the banana seat bicycles, you know, like this yeah. is like even at a 10 speed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been bike riding around my neighborhood now and I getting up to like 15 miles and I'm coming back feeling super accomplished and you were yeah, uh, yeah a child yeah. riding 31 miles. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Can't but we always it. had this one place. It was called George Washington. It was this little town called George Washington. Okay. And we would stop there and there was this little store there. We always would stop. My dad would give us like $5 each to stop and get like a sandwich and a soda and stuff. And yeah, you know, we just thought we were so cool. You were though. You were <laughs> oh, so cool. Absolutely. So yeah. cool. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned lateral moves, and that's something that's interesting because I don't think I've had that conversation with people um, when they're talking about their careers and travels, making lateral moves. Because yeah. obviously, a lot of sacrifice comes with that. Um, yeah. But I mean, what does what does that come down to? Like your confidence in making that decision to make a lateral move. I mean, is right. it just confidence in yourself, confidence in your future? Um, like how, even especially as sort of a young person in their career, I, I mean, how would you process that? Well, you know, you can't you don't know everything when you first start, right? Yeah. So you, you start off in a position in order to make yourself more marketable. You got to think of yourself as like a, as a commodity, right? You got to make yourself. So how am I going to make it that people want to hire me, right? Yeah. You've actually got to build that foundation. And part of that foundation is not just going up. You actually got to make it very strong and solid at the bottom. So when people look at your resume, they see that you have all these different experiences, not just one singular experience. So I think I was very lucky in that I worked across the card business. I worked across um, the corporate card business, across um, the travel business. I sold travel. I sold business travel. I sold leisure travel. You know, so I think having all those different things in my background certainly set me up to be able to uh, run the retail travel business at American Express, um, which was my last job there. I would never have been able to do that job if I hadn't had all these other experiences. I am able to put myself into the shoes of a travel advisor, but I'm also at the same time able to talk to someone really about business travel and about that, that, um, you know, that executive about business travel and how to sell it to them and what their needs are. So I could have never done that in a million years if I hadn't had a strong foundation. Yeah, but I mean, obviously making a move, um, quote unquote, backwards is, it has to be tough for people to decide to do that, especially like, yeah, but you, you seem, you seem, yeah. you seem super comfortable with it. I am because I just, well, and I, you know, I think what it was is that I probably was probably at Amex, it was not unusual. So I also worked in a a culture that actually thrived on that, right? A culture that encouraged it. So you actually, you were never going to go up to the, like, there's, 
there's a lot of different level, a lot of different manager positions. And then there's a lot of different director positions, right? And there's all the different levels within managers and different levels within director. So you might, I, if you're a manager in card versus the manager's health, maybe you get a little bump in salary, but not really. It's more about you getting that experience. So therefore, when that director position came open, you are ready to take it. And like I said, I don't, there's no way I would have become a vice president at Amex if I hadn't done those things. I mean, I was, I was a director three different times. Um, in three yeah. different positions. Um, and sometimes I was at one time as a director for one year. You know what I mean? So it's not like you're doing it forever. Yeah. So you did, you sought out different experiences yeah. in the workplace. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I think I get bored really quick. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I loved it because I got to a point that I, you know, I, I found what I really was passionate about. And I was in my last position at Amex for nine years um, running the retail travel business. And that was a blast. I absolutely loved it. And I would you know, it's, uh, I, I just saw that Amex as a company was changing a little bit, um, still one of the strongest travel and, and, you know, companies out there, but things were changing. And so I, it was, a uh, it was the right time for me to make a move as well. Yeah. I know, I know a lot of people on Wall Street use Amex as sort of a, a measurement of the, of the travel business now, like how well, how well Amex is doing as a company, just because travel is just still a, such a significant part of their bottom line too. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think a lot of people made that connection, I guess, in the consumer world, but it is, right. Yeah, Amex is such a huge travel business, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But going back to your question regarding um, lateral moves and, and wanting to do it, I'll tell you right now, I guarantee you, neither of my daughters would even consider it. Do you know what I mean? I think there's a, a, a different, I think it all depends on the culture of the place you're at and your age. Like, I think that they think that you just have to keep going up, right? That, and you, you actually even use the word going backwards. I didn't look at it as going backwards. Yeah. I've looked at it as making myself stronger. But so I think it's just a different. Approach. Yeah, because when you said that, like I had to swallow because I was like, wow, like that you just seem super fine with like I said backwards. You didn't even you, you didn't I, even think that was part of the definition. I did um, not think of it as part of the definition, not yeah. even a little bit. But why do you think that do you think? I mean, I, I'm probably your daughters are in their 20s. Yeah, I think, yeah, right? 20s, yeah. Uh, almost 27 and 20. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and, I I'm uh I'm probably around, I'm probably in their age demographic and yep. yeah, I had the same reaction. I think they would have. Why, why would you do that? Like, why would you not be like, you have to, but I think there's a, you know, I interview a lot of people and I've, um, you know, for jobs over the years and it really has changed what the demands are of this younger generation of what they expect right away of what they're going to get. And um, no offense, but I think they think, <laughs> think you know it all and you don't. And, and you know, you actually have to experience things. You actually have to, like I said, walk a day in the shoes of some of these people in order to really be able to understand it. You can't just think you've read a book about it or you took a class and you're ready to go do it. Yeah. You actually have to live it. And, um, and every day, the cool thing about my job now is that every day it's something new. You know what I mean? And every day I still find that I'm still learning. I, I love, I absolutely, it's, I think that's the best part of my job is that you're constantly being challenged. Yeah. You never know. So when was, after Amex, did you go right into the cruise industry right after Amex? I did, yeah. So that was kind of a big risk on, I think, so overseas part. Um, but I knew a lot <laughs> about cruise. <laughs> well, I mean, I knew about it because we sold it. Um, mm -hmm. I knew a lot of people, of the travel agents, and the advisors in the network. So I thought, I think that what they saw in me was somebody who could help to um, get more, uh, even a stronger sales channel through that, through the networks, right? Which I absolutely was able to do. But I certainly didn't know much about running a, a cruise business. Um, and so I had a lot to learn, which was also exciting. I think there's nothing better than that. When you, but it's so scary, you know, that first six months, you really feel like you're just being attacked with new information and you're trying to digest it all. Yeah. Um, so it's tough. Yeah, attacked with new information. I think I've I've I think I've had that experience before too. Especially, I mean, talking to people like you who are who are clearly know more about the business than I do. I always, what my issue is, I think, is I always worry about what I'm going to say in case I'll sound sort of ignorant or arrogant. <laughs> Good. That's what I'm always worried about. No, you know, I just ask a lot of questions. Okay. You know, and then so ask. how long how long were you at Silversea then? Um, I was there about three years, almost okay. three years. Yeah. So um, and it was a it was a really good experience and lots to learn. But you know, with going back to the culture of a company, um, I think people don't always um, consider that as much as they should either. You know, I, I had a had a different experience from the culture of American Express to the culture of a family owned a, Italian business, a very very different than what I had experienced at Amex. So it, it wasn't. I, I guess I kept kind of comparing everything to that, which was in hindsight was a mistake because I think every new experience should be different. Um, but I just thought it wasn't for me and I thought it had to be different. But um, so after I was then approached by um, Butch Stewart who owned Sandals and Butch asked me to come um, and to be the president of Sandals. 
which was um, very exciting because I, I have all the respect in the world for Adam Stewart. And um, he said, you know, Adam will run operations, you run sales and marketing. Could see the two of you working really well together. And I, and I actually think we would have, but once again, it was a, about the culture and about the family business. And I just was not going to fit in. And I knew that probably in almost instantly after joining, which is, I think is so frustrating, you know, and at the time you just sort of kicking yourself and you're mad at yourself. But I look back now and it's like, I wouldn't be in the position I am today if I hadn't done those things. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and I know it sounds really cliche, but everything does happen for a reason and every experience does make you stronger. So, yeah, I, I get that. I hear that a lot. Everything happens for a reason. And sometimes it's difficult to process, I think. And yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm of that belief, to be honest, but it is that is a common thing people seem to say now is everything happens right. for a reason, because I guess a lot of right. things are just unexplainable, too. Right. But I would never be able to be a CEO of Uniworld running a river cruise business, you know, with a majority of my business in Europe, if I had never left Amex to join Silver Seas in really more of a sales position is kind of how they saw it. They called it president, but really more sales. And then, you know, making the mistake of going into another business, I was, you know, that was just a little hiccup. But then I had the pleasure of going to work for um, Royal Caribbean mm -hmm. under, in, uh, under uh, Azamara Club Cruises um, under Larry Pimentel. And Royal Caribbean is an incredible company. I mean, it's a, it's a machine. It, it's um, really impressive. And Richard Fain's amazing. Um, and it was so nice to work for Larry. And I, you know, and Larry was uh, really an amazing mentor who was trying to help me to maybe someday take over for him. And that was the idea when I was brought on. So I was doing a lot of mentoring with him and learning from him, which was incredible because he gave me the chance to work on the transformation of the new ships when they redid them, I really, I really truly enjoyed it. And I don't think if I, and I, I would probably still be there if I hadn't gotten the phone call from uh, Brett Tolman yeah. calling me up and saying, you know, hey, Ellen, um, my, I would like you to hire you as our CEO. A lot of times people say to me, it's like, you know, people don't just get those phone calls. And it's like, the one advice I would give young people is it's all about the relationships and the connections that you make over time. I knew Brett when I worked at Amex. So when I worked at American Express, I actually went on the inaugural of the Antoinette, oh of the God. River Royale, of the, um, and of the River Tosca. So I actually knew the Tolman family and I knew Brett all of these years. So all of these years we kept in touch. We'd have coffee once in a while, or he came to town or he'd send me a birthday wish. I'd send him a birthday wish. It's those little things like that that kept us connected though, that when he was thinking of someone for that position, he thought of me. And thank goodness he did. You mentioned Larry Pimentel, Richard Fain, Brett Tolman. Um, yeah. You've clearly, you clearly have the confidence of all these people like these these luminaries in the industry these people who are sort of standing in the industry and I'm, I'm wondering why you think they have such confidence in you like clearly you you've 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 uh you've gotten results everywhere you went but i mean what what do you think is in you that's sort of shown them that to have confidence to to, to bring you on and to, to run operations i think you're i think you, you just nailed it it's about that my past results you know I've, I've always been able to prove myself i've always driven results i you know I had an incredibly strong business at American Express, you know, and I'm also a, I'm, I always raise my hand. I always say, you know, okay. it's like, if there's ever something to learn or to do or to, to try next, I'm always the first one to say, I'll do it. I never to, I'm all, it's, it's always part of my job description. Yeah. The way I look at it, everything is, uh, and even today, everything is part of my job description. I don't look at, I roll up my sleeves and get right in the middle of stuff if I need to. You know, I talk to guests on the phone all the time. I talk to travel advisors on the phone all the time, um, whatever needs to get done. So I get, or maybe I'm lucky. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I guess I, it's, um, I'm fortunate that I have that confidence. <laughs> I mean, so how was, how was it working for Larry? I mean, what kind of things did you learn from him? I think what Larry gave me was uh, he also gave me some of that confidence. I think that's funny you say that because he gave me some of that confidence. Larry's an incredible marketer. Um, okay. So really what I picked up from Larry more than anything else was just some of the ideas behind um, marketing and how to position things. And, um, and he's, he also taught me about the it's okay to kind of look at what everybody else is doing. Uh, I think sometimes I would always try to think that I had to recreate the wheel all the time. He'd be like, no, no, no. You know, like you could take something and you can just maneuver it slightly um, to make it successful. Yeah. Now, Azamar is a, I know Azamar got sold during the pandemic, but it is, a, it is a really terrific and distinct brand. Yeah, um, it is. So it must've been nice to work for, for, to work for such a unique company, I guess. It was, it was, and, and they had, they actually had a position in the marketplace that was different than others. And that's, and that's what I, also what I love about Uniworld. We've got a position in the marketplace that's, that's different than others. No one else has their ships look like mine or floating, really floating boutique hotels with the crew that are owned by us, everything owned by the family and 100% debt-free even after COVID. Nobody else has that, yeah. you know? 
Yeah, that's I, I. So when I was doing some research before talking today, the New York Times. I think you had an article in the New York Times, or you were quoted by the New York Times, calling it a floating boutique hotel. And I don't think there's a better way to describe River Cruise experience. I I, I spoke to Kristen Kars about this, and I know it's a different. You, the ships are different, and it's a different kind of company. But it is the River Cruise industry is just such a unique industry, and I it it's one I do recommend to a lot of people who who haven't yet who haven't yet considered it. Yeah. No, I agree really a great story I just got yesterday actually was we have some guests who just finished something called our ultimate France which is sailing out three of our ships in France so they're in Bordeaux they're in Paris and they're um in Lyon down to, um and so doing the three rivers there and then they came they called from the ship and made another reservation for October wow. to go on the Danube and now they just called yesterday to make another trip to go on the Christmas market so this is a couple who's going to sail with us five times in 2021 so I actually called their travel advisor to ask the question so oh well, I, actually I wrote the travel advisor note to say thank you thank you for recommending us in the first place I can't believe this you know and I saw that this was a past guest so they sailed with us in 2019 one time so they sailed with us in 2019 for one time fell in love with it um, actually had bookings for 2020 and then they moved them and then they when they moved it they added so they had three instead of two and they just are in love with river cruising now they used to be just ocean cruisers and now they love the smaller ships the intimacy you know they want to see all these cool little places that you just yeah. could never see any other way unless you're on a river cruise and they just love the convenience and the uh and they love the brand they just love the team on board and and the hospitality that we bring yeah, exactly. Um, and so you've been at Uniworld for how many years now? Five. Just Five celebrated years. my fifth anniversary. Yeah. Oh well, congrats! Congratulations. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. I mean, have you seen the the segment's popularity grow over the five years? I know it's a short period of time, but have you seen more interest in river cruising? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we've we've just watched it skyrocket. And thank you to Viking for doing that. You know, they they yeah. put river cruising on the map. They really did. And um, now my job, along with the travel advisors and people I talk to, is to figure out how people understand the difference between Uniworld and Viking or Uniworld and AMA and helping people understand it, they're all good. This is a cool thing. We're in a really cool space. It's just about finding the right thing for the right person. Yep. Um, and everyone has to figure out what's, what's best for them uh, and what they want out of their vacation. Um, so, no, I've seen it grow dramatically. I actually did a quick... Um, kind of back of the envelope um, numbers, because we're all private companies, right? So you don't have any of the numbers specifically out there to be able to say like with you know, Royal Caribbean and, and CL, those are all public. So you can get the actual PAX numbers so you can figure it out. So I took what my average was and kind of did it based on number of ship and on occupancy to try to figure out how much it's grown since 2016. And it was something like, you know, 207%, you know, it was, a, it was a really crazy number. And I did that from 2016 up through, uh, no, it was 2014, 2016, yes, 2016 up through 2020. Um, and it was a pretty interesting, um, I just wanted to get an idea of how much we have grown so I wanted to show how the industry had grown and then how Uniworld had grown. And what's interesting is we have by no means grew as fast as the industry. We're growing more like about a 12% rate because we have, we're very thoughtful about how we do things. And like I mentioned earlier, we're transforming our ships instead of just uh, disposing of them and building a new one because we're trying to be more sustainable, right? And trying to re just reuse something if you can. And the whole of a ship lasts forever. So, you know, not forever, but you know, yeah. a pretty darn long time if you take care yeah. of it. Yeah, I know. The, I know the Travel Corporation, which is the parent company, has a there's a there's a significant concentration on sustainability and uh, yep. and, and sort of leaving places better than we found them. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, a big focus on the people, the planet, and the wildlife, and uh, they actually have a foundation called the Tread Right Foundation that actually helps to fund some incredible people or or facilities around the world. And uh, you know, it's even during COVID, they still continue to stay focused on giving back. Yeah, it really is an incredible, uh, an incredible corporation. Um, but I'm curious because you mentioned the growth of river cruising. But do, do, would you be? I don't think you'd even be able to answer this question. But I mean, what kind of market share did river cruising have when you were a Friday girl at, at that at that travel? Was it even a thing back then? It wasn't even a thing. I think yeah. it was a thing in Europe, like okay. a thing in Europe. And these were really lousy ships. Do you know what I mean? This was like, yeah. you know, you see some of the old pictures of like, uh, you know, four bunk beds in a little room. Um, and people that called not a river cruise. So it was very different. It didn't have the nice meals. It didn't have the nice, you know, the beautiful, the, the, it was there's no comparison. Um, yeah. It didn't, I think, I don't think it even existed. You know, I honestly with you, when I became a girl Friday, I didn't really even know the ocean cruise had existed. So I remember um, like that's back in the day of Kathy Lee Gifford. I don't know if you probably don't even know who that is, but she was <laughs> the, the gal from Car Carnival Cruise Line. 
And that was another, the, the fun ship stuff was on the new, on the, that was their commercial. And that's like the only cruise line. And then someone talked to me one time about Cunard and taking a crossing. So it was like the only two I ever heard of. And then Royal Caribbean kind of came into the picture. And yeah, I was speaking to uh, cruise planners, Michelle Fee a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about her experience on, on, a, on a ocean ship. And I think mine was, I don't even know if you'll remember this, but the big red boat, it was, yeah, uh, yeah it was like a kid. Yeah. My parents took me and my sisters, uh, my sisters and I on that on that ship when we were when we were younger i think um but yeah. i do remember i do remember being on the ship i do remember it being incredibly rocky that's really the only experience i have and i think daffy duck and bugs bunny were on board there you go yeah there you go. i think so, that was it so uniworld do you remember your first uniworld sailing sailing was it was it the sailing you met brett on yeah no so the my very first sailing was actually it was the river royale and it was in 2006 and um she was the, the inaugural of that ship and uh, she was in uh, Bordeaux and no, she wasn't. She was on, in Lyon. She's now in Bordeaux. And um, I remember going on board and actually none of the Tolmans were there. It was a different a gentleman who was running the company. So I met, I was invited as because I worked for American Express to go see this ship. And my husband and I went on it. We just thought it was so super cool. Like right away, I loved it because I loved how small it was and you never had to worry about anything. And uh, it was really cool because that ship then became the super ship Bon Voyage and we moved it over to Bordeaux. So I actually got to christen that ship two years oh, ago. Wow. So my first ship to go on River Royale and then I got to christen that ship. So I feel like it was kind of meant to be. Um, so everything does happen for a reason, Dan. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you ever think about that progression or, or that that journey like from from being an Amex on that riverboat now to christening a new ship, christening that same ship? I mean, yeah, do you take, no, do you I, take time. I guess the question is, do you take time to reflect on, on I, the I career? do. Yeah. I do. And I, and I pinch myself. And I like I say, sometimes I'm like, gosh, I am I the luckiest person alive? Or am I just am I smart? Or am I creative? I think, I, you know, it's got to be a combination of all those things. Because, you know, like I said before, even at Amex, when I was a frontline travel agent, I then became a pace setter, which, you know, you get to go on this trip and you get this award. I then got to host pace setters when I was at Amex. Wow. You know what I mean? So and I used to every year I hosted it, I would bring my award with me. And I still have my award in my office. So it's like, and I would bring it to, I'd hold it up and say, I get it. I get how important this day is that, you know, you earned this because I earned it one time and not many executives can say that. Yeah. And I imagine that comes with a level of respect too, from the people you're speaking about because, because you were in the, their shoes. Right. No, it does help. And especially yeah. talking to travel advisors, they really appreciate that I get what they're going through. You know, I think when we're putting out our prom promotions and things, when I joined, I saw that we were putting out a different promotion, like every week, you know, and you're bombarding them. They can never remember that. So we actually have streamlined it. We literally do two big promotions a year. That's it. And they okay. run for long periods of time because you cannot expect people to remember all this stuff. And, and otherwise, if they, if it's too complicated, they're not going to sell it. You know, you got to keep it simple, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good, that's a good point too. Uh, and I guess the promotion thing, I mean, if you know another promotion is coming next week, maybe you're not super concentrated on the one that's in your mailbox right now. Correct. Exactly. Um, I'm also curious because I mean, your journey in travels, I, so you, you told me you grew up in, in Washington state, and then I know you mentioned New York and I assume with the big cruise lines brought you to Florida. Right. Now you're in LA. Right. Correct. Yeah. So I moved down to, um, Fort Lauderdale with my job at Silver Seas, I actually could walk to the office. I was, lived yeah. so close. I lived in a little area called Rio Vista. And I was right there on, uh, on uh, right there, right downtown Fort Lauderdale. And then um, we had to move to LA and that was a big deal. To, I have my daughter, my youngest at the time was a sophomore in high school. So kind of a big deal to move someone in the middle of their school, yeah. high school year. But um, she, it was very funny when it's a family, I said, look, I don't have to take this job right now. I love the job I have, I'm doing great. And you know what, something else will come along when she's out of school. And she said to me, no way, mom, I want to move to California because I want to meet the Kardashians. <laughs> so I think she really thought she was going to meet the Kardashians. Um, but uh, no, she was all for it. I'm very lucky. My kids are very outgoing and uh, super, um, you know, very supportive of me, as is my husband. I'm, I honestly, you can't, big part of my success is, is, is the boy. Um, they help me to be that. You can't, it's hard to do it all. Yeah. So any, I mean, you, you seem to very much like LA too. Oh, I love it. I yeah. love it. You know, the weather's just amazing. Uh, I'm actually yeah. sitting outside right now. Um, it's beautiful. Um, it, you don't have the humidity at nighttime. It cools off. Uh, we, where we live is kind of out We're in LA County, but we're um, it, just outside of the Valley a little bit. So I don't have the same level of traffic as everybody else. Okay. So it's a beautiful place in 20 minutes. 
And it's actually interesting because this little valley area is also where Viking is and Ama is. Okay. So Viking, Ama, and Uniworld are within like miles of each other. And I just find that fascinating that European river cruise companies are all located yeah. in Southern California. Yeah. It's like Silicon Valley for, for river cruise yeah. companies. There yeah, you that's go. amazing. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Yeah. But... Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I just have a couple more questions. I, I would, because we were talking about your past and, and your career, I'm wondering, I mean, do you have any goals for your future? Any anything both for you personally and and for Uniworld? Uh, any any rivers you want to sail? Any any things you want to do to sort of transform the industry, continue growing market share, things like that? Yeah. So um, it's interesting. During COVID, I spent a lot of time thinking about what what's next and what are we going to yeah. do next. So um, and we did a lot of really fun things. We put out a mystery cruise. So we okay. put out this cruise where people don't even know where they're going to go. No one thought it was going to work. And we ended up selling three of them. The first one sold out in, in four hours. Um, you know, so the how, average how many guests per, per cruise? Well, so it's a... just the, so this is the, the, the first, the, the ship's like 125 passengers. So okay. small. But the point is, is like these people don't have a clue where they're going. They know that they're traveling on June 2nd of 2022. They know that I'm hosting it. So I'm, maybe they assume it'll be good um, and it's going to be amazing, uh, but they don't know anything else. And what we're going to tell them is just before then, so we're doing their airline tickets for them too. So then what we'll do is we'll tell them, you know, a few months out, probably three months out where they're actually flying to. Okay. That still won't even tell them necessarily what ship and what they're going to do because we've actually recreated the entire experience. Um, okay. So it's going to be awesome. So that was really fun to work on that together as a team. Wait, so you, um, did, you won't even tell them what region you won't even tell nope. until three months. Wow. Yeah. And then we'll give them a packing list also to tell them what because every day it's going to unveil what's going to happen the next day yeah so that, that is super unique happening. yeah that's that's yeah. that is really incredible yeah so we're doing that we're also going to have a um we put out a rivers of the world so our, our version of a world cruise mm -hmm. so we, it's actually 46 nights uh starting off in egypt and then going to italy and then going to budapest and france and ending up in portugal down into lisbon and uh, it'll be for 80 guests traveling together with a traveling concierge um, and really is seeing the world in a different way. Um, and uh, didn't think that would work necessarily for sure either. And it's been very successful. That's great. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's just like yeah. we're trying to think of new ways to do things more than anything else. And then we partnered up with, um, to me also, I've been very focused on partnerships. So a few years ago, we partnered with Aqua Expeditions and we actually have sail. So I wasn't, I didn't have a ship on the Amazon and I wanted one. So I decided instead of trying to build one or do our own thing, we partnered with the best, which is um, Aqua Expeditions. And so we charter one of their ships and sell it to our guests. And that works really well. Um, that start, actually, our first sailing will happen in sep uh, September 6th. So looking forward to that. And then uh, this last weekend, we did our first cruise and rail. So we partnered with Golden Eagle Luxury Trains. And we uh, had our first journey of going from Zurich down to Venice. And actually, at this very moment, the guests are on their way from uh, Venice back to Zurich. So, wow. um, so I, I think I'm going to continue to focus on partnerships. I don't think there's any new rivers necessarily. I, I hope to be able to figure out how I can work closer with, um, you know, with the executives, uh, executive team that I work on it with them, with, um, with the, t the travel corporation, just to uh, continue to learn about the other businesses and help support them and just work together. Um, I think there's a lot of synergies that we are not taking advantage of. Yeah, the, the train, I think the rail experience is incredible. My parents did a rail experience in Europe for their honeymoon 30, maybe 30, I don't know, 35 years, 30, yeah. I don't know, somewhere around there years ago. And uh, they always recommend it. They always say you have to, if you're going to see Europe, you have to see it by rail. You have to, you have to do the sleeper car, you have to do the whole experience. And I've done the rail in Europe, um, not on their budget. Like when I was in right. college, we did it. And uh, it, I don't know, I'm not sure I had the same glamorous experience they had, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that this one is glamorous. Uh, yeah. It's very nice. <laughs> I'm sure individual is, yeah. sleeper cars, individual, you know, they're all en suites. Um, so, yeah, I think it, the, the, you know, beautiful food, uh, yeah. great service, you know, and incredible, you know, going through the Swiss Alps. You can't go, I'm sure it's stunning. Yeah. Well, I want to again thank you for, for taking the time to talk to me today, uh, today again. I know how busy you are and the industry is becoming. And, uh, yeah, but it's, it's always great to talk to you and uh, hope, I hope to see you again in person pretty soon. I look forward to it, Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.